Hello everyone, this is Jozef Nagy here and in this video I will talk about discretization. The goals of this tutorial are the following. I want you to understand discretization. I will concentrate on spatial discretization, why you need phase interpolation and how you can change the schemes. I will concentrate on the divergence term. If you watched my last tutorial, then you know that this is the convective term and I will use five schemes, the upwind scheme, the linear scheme, linear upwind, quick and cubic. And I will simulate five seconds of the one dimensional transport of a passive scalar. This is the same case. I used that in the last tutorial and I will post process it. But in the last tutorial, I changed the physical values like the velocity or the diffusivity. In this tutorial, I will change numerical settings. So we will use the same solver, the scalar transport form solver, which solves a transport equation for a passive scalar. Here you see the transport equation. Go watch my last tutorial on the convection and the diffusion term if you did not do that. Because here I want to concentrate on discretization. Why should you care about discretization? In CFD, we are solving partial differential equations like this general transport equation of the quantity phi with the density rho, the convective term and the diffusive term and source terms that you might have. And if we compare this equation to the equation that is being solved in scalar transport form, you see that it is very similar. Now, actually, if I set rho to be 1 and phi to be t or passive scalar, then you end up with this equation. So you have 1 and t, this is this term, the partial time derivative, and rho is 1 and u and phi is t, so you end up with the convective term and we assume a constant diffusivity throughout the simulation and in the entire domain, so you can pull this out and with nabla in nabla gives a Laplacian and phi is t and I ignore the source terms here. So actually we are solving this equation with some simplifications. Now I hope that by now you know that we are solving the equations for finite volumes. I sketched two such finite volumes here with the, two, with the centers P, the center of your cell and the N, the center of the neighboring cell. And you always have a face that these two cells share and you have the normal vector. Now if you have an orthogonal grid then the normal vector is parallel to the vector from your cell center to the neighboring cell center. In a, a non-orthogonal grid, these two vectors are not parallel anymore. And you are, what we are doing, we are do, uh, making an integral, a volume integral over our finite volume, over our cell. And in transient simulations, we also make a time integral over our time step. But here I will concentrate on the volume integrals. How do you solve a volume integral, for example, of a divergence, where you have a spatial integration and also spatial derivation. Now, I assume that you have some knowledge on mathematics and that you are familiar with the Gauss theorem. If you're not, then look it up in a book or Google it. This states that if you have a volume integral over the divergence of a given value, then you can write this volume integral as a surface integral of this value. Now we use this Gauss theorem for the volume integral of the divergence term. We have the divergence of rho u and phi and we are writing it as a surface integral over our cell, taking this quantity here, rho u and phi. 
and then we are making an approximation and we are summing over the surface and rho u and phi on the surfaces. And for that we need the values on the surfaces. If you remember back, for example, the pressure, the velocity or t, the passive scalar, we always had a list in our files. And there we have the 100, 1000 entries and those entries were for the cells and they were stored for the cell centers. So we have to calculate the values on the faces out of the values in the cell center. For the diffusion it's uh, similar. We are writing the volume integral as a surface integral and then we approximate it with a sum over the faces and for that all we also need the gradient on the face and for the gradient of the face we have an orthogonal and a non-orthogonal term for details please check for example the dissertation of Henry Crucian but again we need values on the surface on the faces of our cell now the question is how do you calculate that Big question mark. So I made a rather simplistic sketch here of our cell centers P and N and I indicated the face. I put it into the center and we know these values P and N. So let's say this is 1 and this is 2. Now the question is what's the value here in between? Is it 0? I mean if this is 1, if this is 2, then is it 1.5 or something else? How can you calculate it? For example, a very simple possibility is the upwind scheme where you just ignore everything in between the cell centers and you say that I don't care about anything in between them and I will set the value on the face to be the value in the cell center. And which value you take is depending on the direction of your velocity. So for example, the inner product of your velocity and the surface normal here is bigger than zero then this means that your velocity is going out of your cell then take the value of the cell center but if the velocity vector is pointing into the cell then take the value from the neighboring cell and if you think of a Taylor series, this would correspond to the first term of your Taylor series. So you would say that if a general function at a given point A is very well approximated by a constant function. Another possibility is the linear scheme where you are making a linear interpolation between the two cell values. So I put the face into the center. So if this is 1 and this is 2, then here we would have a value of 1.5. But if the location of the face would be closer to P, then it would be lower. And if the face was closer to N, then this value would be higher. So we are making a linear interpolation. And if you think of a Taylor series, this would correspond to the first two terms, so the constant and the linear term. Another possibility is the linear upwind scheme, where you take only one reference value, either in your cell or in the neighboring cell, and then you use the gradient, and you are interpolating with the gradient out of the cell center onto the face. And which value you take is again depending on the direction of your velocity similar to the upwind scheme. So you either take the value in your cell or in the neighboring cell and then you interpolate the values onto the face. Now I stop here with the, the description of the schemes because I'm pretty sure that 50% of you is already asleep or just skipped to the simulations. But um, to get more information, go to your user guide and there you have a 
more detailed description of the possible schemes in OpenFOAM, interpolation schemes, schemes for scalar fields, for vector fields, gradient schemes, Laplacian schemes and divergent schemes, what I am now talking about. And here you will find, for example, the linear scheme, the upwind scheme, linear upwind, quick, cubic. And we will use these in the simulations. So now what I will do, I will jump into the simulations. I will use the same case, the one dimensional transport of a passive scalar, like you did it in the last tutorial with the scalar transport foam solver. So I will just go into the tutorial case of the scalar transport foam solver. If you did the last tutorial, then you will have a base case already here. But maybe some of you did not do the last case, the last tutorial. So I will set up the base case again, but watch out. I will do slight adjustments here. I will just set it up here. For that, I will copy the shock tube tutorial from the compressible sonic foam solver, laminar and shock tube. I will copy it here. Now I have the shock tube. I will rename it to, let's say, discretization underscore base case. And I will enter this case. Here I delete. The values that we don't need. Now we only have T and U. And here I will change the boundary, the boundary condition from zero gradient to inlet outlet. And what this does, this is a zero gradient boundary condition if the velocity is going out of your geometry through that boundary and if the velocity is going into your geometry through that uh, boundary then it is a fixed value boundary condition and it is in this case zero it is fixed to zero i'm sorry in let value it looks like this and with this i want to prevent a value of higher than zero entering our domain. But I will come to that a little bit later. And we have our velocity. I will change that uh, with the set fields dictionary. I will not use zero.org and I will delete the scripts, go into constant. We do not need these dictionaries but we need a transport properties dictionary and I will just copy the one from the pits daily tutorial that was set up for scalar transport foam now we have the transport properties and here I set the diffusivity to zero and the reason for that is if I go back to our transport equation here then I set this to zero so I neglect diffusion here and I only take a look at the convection and I will only change the schemes for this term and we will take a look at the differences what's happening there okay so if I go into polymesh and open up the block mesh dictionary it's the same case one dimensional case with 1000 cells in the x direction and one cell in the y and the z direction and we only solve the equations in the z in the x direction defining this with the empty boundary condition and our geometry has a length of 10 reaching from minus 5 to a plus 5. okay i will go into system i will delete control dict fv schemes and fv solution the reason for that is that these were set up for sonic foam, but we are using scalar transport foam. So I will just take these dictionaries from the Pitts Daily tutorial, which was set up for scalar transport foam, and copy these three dictionaries to here, like this. 
Now I have these dictionaries here. I open up the control dict. We are starting at zero and time is five. And before I use the delta t of 0.01, now I will use 0.005. I will come to that in a little bit. At first I will change this to runtime and write in tower to one because I want to save it after one, two, three, four, and five seconds. I save this. Now the reason for this time step instead of 0.05 is the Kuron Friedrichs Levy condition. If you remember back, the Kuron number or the CFL number is defined by the velocity by your time step divided by the length of your cells. And this value should be smaller than one, equal or smaller than one. And I will just type this in here. So the Kuron number is velocity multiplied by dt divided by dx. And I will transport our scalar with a velocity of one in the positive x direction. So we will use a velocity of one or delta t. We used a delta t of 0 0.01 before. And we are using now 1000 cells. Our geometry has a length of 10 meters. This means that one cell has a length of 0 0.01, so one centimeter, and this corresponds to a Kuron number of one. Now this is the maximum value. And I know that the quick scheme will not work with this time step. So this is the reason why I am using a delta T of 0 0.005 in order to have a Kuron number of 0 0.5, which is less than one. So we are good there. So this is the reason why I'm using a different time step. Good. So now let's check the schemes here. We will change this value here, but I will do that later on. And we will leave the settings in FV solution. I will not use sample here, but I will use set fields. So I will set a value for the velocity of one zero zero in the entire domain. And I will set the value to zero again for the scalar in the entire domain. And then I will define a box in the center from minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5. And within this box, I will set the value of our passive scalar to be one. Same case setup as in the previous tutorial. I will create the mesh. I will set the fields. And if I take a look at our scalar here, you see that we have the 1000 entries with zero and one for the cell centers. I might add. And then down here we have the boundaries. Good. Now I will just create the dummy file for Paraview. Yes, please save it. Very good. Now we have the base case set up correctly. Now I will make copies of that five copies because we will do five simulations. So I will just copy this case. And I will call the first one discretization underscore upwind, then linear, linear upwind actually, then quick and cubic. Now we have the five cases that we will use for the simulations. Here you see these five cases. And at this point, I will stop now. I will conclude the first part of this tutorial. I hope that you learned something and that you enjoyed the first part. I thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the second part of the tutorial.